So I was going to show some charts, and I decided instead I was just going to say what Gersh said. Are there any questions? Because <laughs> Gersh does a great job. But yeah, and some, you know, I feel like sometimes the technology guys are in that gap between vision and reality and what's going on day to day. I hear things like, oh, we tried that 30 years ago. That'll never work. Well, the technologies have advanced somewhat in the last 30 years. I think maybe we can make it work now. Or, oh, yeah, that's not going to work for another 30 or 40 years. Please don't even bother going down that path. And so the aerospace industry is really interesting in that uh, innovation and technology development is absolutely critical in everything we've done in aerospace and in space. But it's inherently risky business, right? Um, just, ex just getting off the planet, right? The energy that it takes to escape the gravity well makes it dangerous in and of itself. And so there's this real yin-yang or tension, creative tension between pushing new technologies to get new capabilities to do more ambitious things while making sure all the time it's safe and affordable and we can, and we can do that. And sometimes it takes taking those technologies all the way to a flight demonstration to show that they, TRL-7 we call it, that they work in the space environment. And so that's something I've been you know, thinking about. How do, we, how do we have a more productive conversation around developing new technologies that enable new capabilities while you know, not, uh, infusing them in, in a path that it, they don't get, um, they don't end up dying in the gap between vision and, and what goes on day to day. I'll also say that um, I've been in Washington about uh, two years. I spent most of my career at NASA Langley Research Center. Uh, the Mother Center, uh, for reasons I'll explain in a little bit. Um, and if Gerst is varsity when it comes to dealing with Washington, I'm not sure I'm even junior varsity yet. I still might be freshman. So I'm still trying to figure out how to navigate in the 17 square mile logic free zone, but it's been, it's been really an exciting couple of years, and I'm looking forward to the, the next years also. I still, uh, I still have 29 years at NASA. I never regret for a day coming to work for NASA, and I'm really looking forward to the future. Okay, clicker. Okay, so technology development is nothing new at NASA, right? Predecessor organization in NASA was NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, established in 1917. Um, well, established in 1915, established their first field laboratory in 1917, which is the Langley Moore Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory in Hampton, Virginia, where I worked most of my career. So Langley celebrated its 100th anniversary this year. So in July, I got to go to Langley, be in the, um, on a former Senate director's panel, which is really, really kind of weird for me. I was only Senate director for a year. I was deputy Senate director for 10 years and Senate director for about a year, one of the shortest serving Senate directors before I got the call to come to Washington. Uh, but I love, these, I love these statements out of the NACA Charter and, and the NASA Space Act. Supervise and direct the scientific, the scientific study of the problems of flight with their view to practical solution. I just love that. And that's what NACA, the NACA labs absolutely did, you know, from all the way up until 1958. And they do that uh, today. I can list the litany of, of um, call your trophies won by the, the NACA labs and inventions that transform the aviation industry. And then NASA, in the NASA Space Act, to provide for research into the problems of flight within and outside the Earth's atmosphere and for other purposes. I love that too, completely open-ended. And, um, and we, have this great, we have this great authority under the Space Act that we very creatively call Space Act Agreements, <laughs> SAAs. Bill alluded to them. And that allows us to partner with, um, with the private sector in a, a somewhat effective way. We, um, other agencies do CRADAs, Cooperative Research and Development Agreements. Uh, we don't do very many CRADAs because we have the Space Act Authority and we do fairly creative things under the Space Act. So this is what we do in space technology. And so just the, the points off of this chart are we develop cross-cutting technologies, right? So they enable, hopefully, human exploration of the solar system, the next generation of science missions across the four areas of science, astrophysics, heliophysics, planetary science, and earth science. We work, we partner significantly with the Department of Defense and the Air Force. Just about everything we fly in, is in space to prove out is partnered with the Air Force in some way, shape, or form. So they, they often have national security applications. And then they have commercial and, and private sector applications also in many cases. And you'll see that hopefully as I'm kind of going through some of the current things that we're working on. Um, and the other thing we're trying to do is, you know, in order to do what we're, in order to achieve this vision of human exploration of the solar system and even more ambitious science missions and create this low Earth orbit economy and an economy beyond low Earth orbit, it's kind of like Gers said, all hands on deck. We're looking for the best and brightest folks 
everywhere in this country and internationally. Uh, we re-engaged engineering research with universities. We just passed our 500th grant, uh, research grant with universities this year in our university programs, as well as small businesses, large businesses, businesses, companies that have been around for 100 years, companies that have been around for 10 years, right? We are just looking for good ideas. International collaboration is a kind of a challenge in the technology area, in the technology arena, because of ITAR and export control. Uh, and that's a nut I'm still trying to crack. We have two collaborative activities with DLR, um, but co-development of technology is tough internationally because of ITAR and export control. So, but we do, we do, I, you know, I meet with uh, representatives from Kness and DLR and ESA and talk with JAXA and, and CSA regularly, and we're gonna try to figure that out. So that's what we're, that's kind of what we're here to do for the agency and the nation. And we are, uh, I mean, previous speakers talked about a lot of what's on this chart and we bo boil down kind of significant drivers in the current space, you know, national ecosystem to these four areas and they're not mutually exclusive. They kind of feed on each other. So increasing access, that not only means lowering the cost of access to space and more frequent access to space, but it also means more efficient and effective travel through space and more innovative ways are getting to destinations that are hard to, to get to and land on in places we haven't been before. You know, eventually we wanna land on Europa and we wanna drill through the kilometers of ice and maybe send a submarine down below the ice to move around in the, in the ocean on Europa and see what's down there, right? See if there are extremophiles or other signs of life down in the liquid ocean on, on places like ocean worlds like Europa. Accelerating the space of discovery, I am just amazed at the portfolio of missions in the Science Mission Directorate. Um, it is, I mean, across all four areas. I show the missions in operations and the missions that are gonna launch over the next three or four years, and it is just incredible. Um, they are literally rewriting textbooks every, every, uh, every month, every year, and uh, the steady stream of uh, release press releases that come out of SMD are just unbelievable. And, uh, and major, you know, uh, this, is, this is only gonna accelerate as we uh, develop technologies and capabilities. The next one is democratization of space. Um, a lot of people kind of cringe at that democratization word, but it really means broadening participation from everybody from governments to the private sector and even citizens. Um, there was a middle school in Alexandria, Virginia that built a CubeSat and launched it off the International Space Station. So if a middle school can be a space-faring entity, that says something about what small sats and cube sats have done and the access to space that uh, NASA and others have provided for those systems. Growth and private investment in space, you've heard that this morning. Uh, Public-private partnerships, you're gonna hear that, you heard that a lot from Bill, you're gonna hear that a lot from me, and then international collaborations, and then growing utilization of space. Diversification, there's markets that are, um, so communications obviously been around for a long time, been profitable. Remote sensing is really starting to take off um, I was on a there's, a, there's a program called the Small Space Technology Initiative in the early 90s. It was out of Sam Venary's group in the old Office of Research, the old Code R, and I was on the Source Evaluation Board for that solicitation, and what everybody was proposing in for utilization of small space, because what a lot of them were proposing was remote sensing applications. Uh, and so here we are two and a half decades later, and the, the advancement of, it was a little bit ahead of its time, Right, two and a half decades later, the advancement of small spacecraft technology, the reduction in cost of launch, and we're really starting to see, as well as IT, right? IT, big data analytics, because a lot of the value is on the back end, right? GPS, right? And uh, remote sensing, a lot of the value is on the back end. It's not on the front end of the production of the spaceflight hardware and software. And that's gonna continue. The space industry it surpasses average GDP growth for the, for the past few years. And then, uh, and then space-based solutions are gonna address global challenges. Remote sensing is a perfect example of that. So here are the, some, you know, some of the things we're just cognizant of. I don't think there will be people in this room, there'll be no surprises there. And then we've said in, in for technology, and particularly space technology, we uh, wanna focus on these strategic thrust areas. So expand utilization of near Earth space, that's the LEO economy and what we can do where technology is an enabler. We wanna develop efficient and safe transportation through space for both human exploration and robotic exploration. Bill talked about the entry, descent, and landing challenge. Mars is really hard to land on. We're the only nation that's landed something on Mars that's worked after it landed, that powered up and actually functioned after it landed. It's, a re it's really hard. It has a poor excuse for an atmosphere, 
right? Its pressure is about 100,000 feet at Earth. It's, enough, it's not enough to slow you down, but it's enough to worry about aerodynamic heating and have worry about flight dynamics and pressure changes, dust storms and changes in pressure density profile. It's, it's hard. And we got to go, like Bill said, from, let's see, Curiosity rover was about 900 metric tons or so. We got to go from a little less than a metric ton to 20 metric tons on the surface for the ascent vehicle for crew. We want lots, lots of partnerships with science on enabling next generation of science discoveries, including something I'll talk about hopefully if I don't run out of time, direct exoplanet imaging. Uh, we are partnered very tightly with advanced exploration systems in HEOMD and on technologies that are really enabling for uh, crews staying safe uh, and productive on their travel through space and then on the surface of other planets. And then there are a set of programs we run for the agency, like small business innovation research that fit into that six card, where the primary uh, focus is on supporting industry and supporting companies, but we leverage what their innovation back into the agency. I'll talk about how we try to do a better job at that leveraging. I will not go bore you with our programs, but they basically boil that boil down into like three areas on this chart, right? Low technology readiness level, or what we call early stage innovation, um, NIAC, our studies, uh, space, tech, re space Tech Research Grants, that is our university program, and then Center Innovation Funds like IRAD at the NASA centers. Um, game Changing Development is our program that gets you through the valley of death, right? The TRL, it's called the TRL Valley of Death, TRL four to six, and gets technologies to the point where they're ready to fly. Not everything makes it, a very small percentage of things make it at an early stage into game changing or onto another technology maturation program and not 100% gets through game changing to TRL-6 and gets to go fly. Uh, and then we have the technology demonstration missions where we actually go, go fly. And then I'll, I'll talk about in our strategic thrust six, those commercial partnerships. Public private partnerships are key to what we do. I think in uh, Space Technology Mission Director, we've kind of upped the game over the last two years and we have two, right now, two uh, kind of uh, partnerships that we've formed. One is called Tipping Point. Um, I think I'm a year ahead of time, but we, we, we coined the Tipping Point uh, moniker uh, a couple of years ago with our first solicitation in 2015 with awards in, in 2016. And they're focused on technology opportunities for partner, you know, leveraging what's going on in the, in the commercial and, and, uh, and in industry, sec industry sectors. We're looking for an intersection between commercial and what the government needs, what NASA needs. They result in fixed price contracts with milestone payments, so the, the mechanism is pretty straightforward, and we require at least a minimum of 25% cost sharing from, from our industry partners. And we, I think we're averaging in the 30-something 30 30 percents on all, these, on all these contracts. I'm going to talk more about robotic and space manufacturing and assembly because of spacecraft and structures, because that's really an exciting area that can transform how we, we, we uh, manufacture and deploy systems. And you see the other areas. Um, you see year, zero awards for our small spacecraft capability demonstration missions. We actually selected two proposals. And as we went through negotiations, uh, they kind of sort, sort of diverged from what they proposed and we ended up not awarding anything. We were very aggressive there. It was um, full up missions, including launch or access to space for two and a half million dollars from NASA. Uh, so we might have been a little bit overly aggressive with what we were asking for there. And uh, so we're rethinking uh, how we move forward on that. And then we, we plan on doing a tipping point solicitation once every year. So end of this month, early next month, we'll come out with the next uh, tipping point solicitation with uh, hopefully three or four uh, topics to, to uh, enter in these collaborations. The other is uh, creatively called announcement of collaborative opportunity. <laughs> Got to get better at, at backronyms. And um, it essentially uh, allows industry access to expertise test facilities at the NASA and other uh, capabilities at the NASA centers. Um, so it, it, we end up uh, signing non-reimbursable space activity. There's no exchange of funds. We fund the NASA workforce and the NASA facilities required for the effort, and the company funds their part of the activity. And you see the, the 13 awards that we made in 2015, and we just made 10 awards ac across these four technology areas in uh, a few months ago. And we'll release ACOs every other year. One thing we're thinking about, and I'm interested to get your take on this, is rather than describe, rather than uh, soliciting for technologies in these narrow areas, is open it up more, right, to say the thrust areas, like three or four of the thrust areas, with some of the key things, priorities under those, and use our two-step, use a two-step proposal process, where we get very brief proposals up front, uh, I have a broad set of ideas and then down select to a smaller set of 
of, uh, of proposals for full proposals that we would consider for selection. So uh, we, we've gotten some feedback that, hey, these are kind of you know, narrow. We have some other areas we'd like to partner with you on. Can you open it up a little bit? So we're, we're considering that. Um, so we've got <clears throat> both through Tipping Point and ACO, we've got over 30 uh, contracts and SAAs in place. And we're learning as we go. This last time, we put a model SAA in the solicitation with the terms and conditions. If you propose and agree to those terms and conditions, we can just sign the SAA and go. If not, in your proposal, we wanted to understand where you wanted to change the model SAA, and we understood that up front before even we did the selection. So that's hope, that's, uh, we're trying to uh, shrink the time from selection to award, which for this first time was a little, I would say, not at the, space of, uh, not at the pace of commercial uh, entities. So we're learning and as we go. Again, we have um, partnerships and contracts with over 380 companies of all varieties and, and with industry. And we are trying to draw in uh, companies that have technologies that are non-aerospace companies that don't realize they have tech that actually could, uh, could help us in aerospace. So for example, we had a challenge, a prize-based challenge. It was called the uh, um, 3D Printed Habitat Challenge. And it was to print the elements of a structure, beams, panels, and domes using uh, regolith simulant, water, and plastics, trash. And uh, we partnered with uh, Caterpillar, heavy equipment manufacturer, Bechtel, the engineering instruction firm, and a venture capital firm. They actually put up the money to run the challenge, and we put up the prize money, and that was really successful. We had two winners. One was an architectural engineering firm out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, never worked in aerospace before, and the other was Penn State University. So through things like challenges and, and these partnerships, we're trying to draw in broader contributors and broader set of technologies beyond just those that are tr from traditional aerospace organizations. Okay, so in each of the thrust areas, I'm just gonna hit on a few things that we're doing. So the Flight Opportunities Program, um, we have uh, contracts with multiple service providers for high altitude balloons, sounding rockets both Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin for suborbital zero-G flights, and we do two solicitations a year for payloads to fly on those vehicles. So we've selected, I think, over 120 payloads for flight, and we've flown about half of those. We Upcoming, we have a new Shepard that has all NASA payloads on it, and so that's been highly successful, and it's one of those things where, in a, in a small way, NASA provided an initial demand for suborbital capabilities. And, uh, and then we're using that um, in, in effective ways, including as a precursor to shake out your experiments before going on the International Space Station. So that's kind of somewhat, in a, in a small way, the demand-driven model that Gers talked about for commercial cargo and commercial crew on a much larger scale. Um, we have partnerships with, I think, every small company developing a small launch vehicle, and we define that as around 350 kilograms of low Earth orbit, in things like advanced materials and structures technology, testing advanced propulsion technology, and particularly technologies like additive manufacturing and avionics to lower the cost of those vehicles to kind of hit a certain price point where they think the market is for the small launch vehicle market. Um, so I think we have partnerships with every single company except for one and, um, and both Tipping Point, where we're collaborating and developing technology, code developing technologies, as well as uh, access to expertise and uh, facilities at the NASA centers. Um, we also, um, are developing satellite servicing technology, uh, the ability to service a satellite that was not designed to be serviced, and we think that is also transformative. Um, and is this whole set of capabilities in, in LEO to GEO of services and this economic activity that I think we've yet to just scratch the surface on, and servicing is one of those things. The extension of servicing is actually assembling, using robotics to assemble systems in space. And then you add 3D printing or additive manufacturing on that, and we could manufacture and assemble systems in space. And just think about the design constraints that go into surviving a launch, the launch environment. The operational environment is actually fairly benign. The launch environment is pretty rough from a mechanical standpoint. So if you are just launching feedstock or mining feedstock, um, and you're 3D printing and assembling systems in space, you can optimize the design for the space environment, and that could be transformed. So we have public power partnerships through Tipping Point with Maiden Space, Orbital ATK, and Space Systems Aral, and they're doing very well in ground demonstrations of these capabilities, and um, in the current phase of the project, and we're hoping 
to be able to take one or more of them to a space flight demonstration either on the state, space station or some other platform in low Earth orbit. So that is one capability we're really excited about and we think is really transformative. Um, developing efficient and safe transportation through space. Um, the big investment here has been in high power solar electric propulsion. So we work with Orbital ATK and uh, deployable space systems to develop two uh, concepts for very large solar arrays to provide the power for a uh, 100, you know, 50 to 300, ultimately 150 to 300 kilowatts of electric propulsion system for the deep space transport. And then Glenn Research Center uh, advanced hull thruster technology. Right now, state of the art is about five kilowatts. We, want it, we, we have thrusters operating at 13 kilowatts. And the other innovation there is magnetic shielding. They're setting up the magnetic shield in the thruster to allow it to have long life and reduce the wear. Um, and so we have a contract with Aerojet Rocketdyne to develop those 13 kilowatt hull thrusters and the target is to fly the, one or more of them by multiple strings of thrusters on the power and propulsion element of the deep space gateway. We also put out a request for information to industry about um, their interest in collaborating with demonstration of the high power hull thruster technology and got a really strong response. And we got 12 or more, you know, really excellent responses and so we're trying to figure out how to, how to best transfer that technology, uh, technology to industry. There's also things that um, collaborations we're entering on figuring out how adding capabilities to upper stages of launch vehicles. So we got a partnership on integrated vehicle fluid management uh, for repressurization as well as power, high power generation to repurpose upper stages like Gerst mentioned. Um, as well as long-term storage of uh, LOX and, and hydrogen and uh, <clears throat> uh, using, uh, you know, using cryo insulation and cryo-cooler technology. So we need that for our deep space, you know, transportation capabilities, but also I think it has applications to, to low Earth orbit. Uh, increased access to planetary surfaces, we talked about this. <clears throat> we want to land heavier payloads with higher precision. Right now, we land in this uh, we do Monte Carlo analysis and simulation, and we land in a 10 kilometer by like 14 kilometer ellipse on Mars. We want to get it down to 100 meter precision, and we also want to more reliably return things from space to Earth. And so um, we're, we've had discussions about how to use EDL technology for reusability for space systems in, in low Earth orbit and, and, and geo, as well as um, cost effective frequent return of things from space from Earth orbit to the ground if we're, we're going to manufacture things in space, which they're doing, which many companies are doing on the space station, for terrestrial use, for Earth, for use on Earth. You got, get, you got to get raw material up and you got to get finished progress product down. And so we're looking at how we can use some of these deployable EDA technologies that package up very small and launches secondary payloads, then deploy and can uh, return large mass to the surface of the Earth. Um, Let's see, enable humans to live and explore. So uh, we're, we're uh, ECLIS, uh, advancing the performance of ECLIS technology is critical, as well as the reliability of ECLIS technology. So for example, we have two technologies for recovering oxygen from CO2 in the spacecraft. And right now, I think on station, we're in the high 40s, 48% or so, something like that. Um, we'd like to get to above 90% oxygen recovery from CO2. Um, a couple of the technologies probably will get us most of the way there, 85% recovery, uh, but we need, we, need, we need to even go beyond what we're doing now. And then there's CO2 scrubbing. Uh, we've developed technologies to improve the portable life support systems, the PLIS on the suits, et cetera. So there's a lot of work there. And all that can transition into the laboratories and the other uh, habitation systems in, or in Earth orbit that are gonna need uh, you know, higher performing, um, high reliability ECLA systems. Surface power systems, um, we're gonna test a one kilowatt fission-based nuclear reactor at the Nevada test site early next year that scales to 10 kilowatts. And for the surface architecture we're looking on Mars, we think these 10 kilowatt units will be able to power the systems that we need to keep crew healthy and safe and productive on the surface of Mars. Human robotics, we're trying to uh, determine the, 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 so we're gonna do something, and Gersh alluded to this, we're gonna do something for the first time they haven't done before, and that is systems that have to operate, are partially crew tended, right? They have to operate in, in say in staging in orbits in cis-lunar space, and they have to, have to operate autonomously and be ready for crew to arrive, and then they have to be set up so crew can interact with the autonomy or not in ways that make the crew effective. And we have not done that, right? N not to mention 
uh, breaking the real-time comm link, right, when we push out of the cislunar space and a whole different mission operations paradigm that we have to work through. Um, so, so this whole uh, integration of robotics, autonomy, and crew is gonna be really critical if we're gonna do safe operations beyond cislunar space and actually push out, push out into deep space. And then ISRU, um, there's, there's lots of ISRU technology from construction to production of fuel and water from, you know, on the moon or on Mars. Uh, and on the 2020 mission, we're gonna generate uh, oxygen from atmospheric CO2 at very low levels using the MOXIE experiment. Uh, a lot going on in science. Dwight Wayne's here. We've got to have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, so. so the most exciting, one of the most exciting things in science is we're developing starlight suppression, adaptive optics, and detector technology to do a demonstration of multispectral direct exoplanet imaging on the W first mission. And so we're going to do we're going to do uh, sensing of the atmosphere of another parent, uh, planet, and if we can detect water vapor, CO two, methane, and oxygen in that atmosphere there's high probability there's life as we know it, carbon-based life as we know it on that planet. So it's indirect life detection on another planet. And we're collaborating, we got the technologies of Tier L5 and game changing, and we're gonna hopefully get them the seven on the W first mission. And then like I said, we run SBIR. One, one plug for uh, a pilot program that we, we've run that's now in STMD is called iTech. We're in the third round of iTech. We put out technology areas for inventors across the nation to bring their solutions to. We select 10 of them to come to you know, present their ideas, and we invite uh, angel investors and, and, uh, um, and other investors to those presentations. And we, we, NASA doesn't put any money into the, the technologies, and so far we've been able to um, get over $40 million of uh, angel and capital investment into these companies to further develop these technologies that then we hope to use back in NASA. So, so far, our iTech has been a real success with respect to raising capital. Hopefully, we'll actually get technologies out of it that we can use back into NASA. So, I think the next is a, oh, oh I'm gonna skip the video. It's three minutes long. <laughs> we have two minutes and 40 seconds left. So, I'll stop there and take questions. Okay, thanks, Steve. I I kind of hate to miss the video, but we'll put it on the website. There you People go. can watch there. Um, I, I think the number one question that the, the group has for you is about debris removal in space. Uh, are yes. you doing any technology development for that? Uh, no, we are currently not doing any technology development for that other than what satellite servicing can do and with respect to uh, debris removal for, I would say, fairly large objects, right? However, um, I think it's, a, it's going to be a real challenge as we're seeing the proliferation of small spacecraft and these very large constellations to deliver broadband services and other, other large scale uh, ventures. Um, so, you know, what I would, I think the current policies are effective, you know, right now, but what we need to do is model how space traffic is going to evolve over the coming decade or decades and see where the challenges are in managing that, particularly from a debris removal standpoint, and see how those uh, policies need to evolve. We can inform policy. We are not the policy uh, making uh, body, nor are we a regulatory agency, but we can work with um, whatever agency is going to manage, manage civilian space traffic, which we need that uh, dearly uh, to project if the current policies are going to be effective moving forward, if not, what changes in policies we need to make. Okay, uh, we've got a number of questions. People are excited about ISRU. So are there partnership opportunities for, in particular, lunar resource uh, prospecting that companies could get involved with today? Yeah, so we are really excited about what's going on in the private sector, with, in industry, with respect to um, their capabilities they're developing to go to the moon and land on the moon. Um, there's absolutely partnership opportunities, and hopefully I can't talk about anything yet, but uh, in, the, in the not too distant future, we're gonna uh, uh, communicate our strategy there. And that is, a, that is game changing. If we can use the water, the frozen water on the North or South Pole on the moon and exploit that as a resource, particularly for fuel, I think that opens up a whole, whole nother uh, set of opportunities for public-private partnerships. Um, and, and it can really uh, make uh, you know, the moon a real um, resource and 
jumping off point for the deep space mission. So the first thing is resource prospector. You know, we got to get a rover. Uh, we, we partnered with AES to develop a rover that has um, more robust mobility as well as the science instrument complement. Um, it's a solar powered rover, so when we go into the permanently shattered craters, we have to get out of the permanently shattered craters or the rover dies. Uh, and we don't really know how steep the slopes are on those craters, and so the first step is to do the prospecting, see how much is there, how difficult it would be to remove, you know, excavate and remove and process into, say, hydrogen and oxygen for fuel. So, but that, is, that could be game changing if, that's, if the business case closes on that. Good. And, and I know we're over time here, but there's so many people that had, uh, voted on this question, I feel like I really need to ask it. What share of NASA's mission and money are being devoted to building up the commercial sector versus deep space exploration? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's an, ex it's an expanding part of our budget through the partnerships that, um, that not only, uh, you know, uh, STMD's doing, but particularly in HUMD, um, and that's where the big money is, right? Um, as well as, I think SMD is going to be looking uh, uh, to establish partnerships and advance commercial space interests uh, in addition to like, things like earth science applications. So I will say this, you know, although STMD doesn't have, uh, has a, frac a small fraction of the NASA budget around three to three and a half percent, you have to view technology and space tech as a, a strategic um, endeavor. It's a, str it's a strategic uh, advantage or strategic uh, capability that you're trying to develop through advancements te of technology that then lead to capabilities to do more ambitious science missions and human exploration in the solar system. Right. Well, thank you, John. I mean, Steve, uh, <laughs> for your great, great talk and discussion about technology development. Thank you. Thanks, man.